Hello everyone and welcome to ACMI's conversation with Rahil Raza. She's joining us all the way from Canada. She's right here in Wellesley, Massachusetts now. She's a world-renowned activist, advocate for gender equity, and proponent of the progressive reform of the religion of Islam. Well, let's just get right into it then. Um, you're here in the Greater Boston area. You came all the way from Canada um, to speak at the Topsfield Congregational Church. You give two talks over the weekend on Islamophobia, political correctness, and you know, modern Islam. What was the message you wanted to bring in those talks this weekend? Well, there were different kinds of messages that I wanted to bring in the talks. On, on Saturday, there was a panel discussion in which there were other speakers as well. And I wanted to speak about uh, political correctness because I believe that political correctness is choking uh, conversation. It's choking dialogue and discussion and debate, which is such an important part of uh, living in the West. I mean, that's why I came to it, to the West, to embrace the values of a liberal, small l liberal democracy and freedom of expression. And uh, so I wanted to, to try and give the audience the message that they can ask any question that they want. And, and this is what I do a lot, is, you know, first try and make people comfortable to understand that this is not a monologue it's on my part, that this is a dialogue. And we would always want to have dialogue because I have discovered in my work that it is ignorance and lack of knowledge that leads to fear. And we don't want people to be afraid, so we want them to be able to ask really, really tough questions. And, and the Islamophobia piece of it was connected because it is this uh, created uh, term, Islamophobia, that is being used uh, you know, to stop people from asking questions. It's a way of totally st uh, stalling the conversation about Muslims and Islam. And in this day and age, uh, how can one do that? So, in your view, what exactly, if you could just quantify a specific definition for political correctness, you know, what does it look like to you? Well, political correctness is essentially not being able to express the truth. Uh, it's it's a kind of diplomacy that is, uh, and you know, has an undercurrent current of untruth in it. It is not being able to talk about the real issues. So, for example. In uh, mainstream media, uh, some mainstream media, they're not allowed to use the word Muslim and Islam and terrorism in the same sentence. Now, I don't see how I can talk about the Boston uh, attacks or talk about the uh, Florida uh, you know, nightclub bombing or San Bernardino without using the terms Islamist or terrorism, because these are all acts in which Muslims in some way or the other have been involved. Now, of course, you have to keep the conversation going and people have to understand understand that this does not mean all Muslims are terrorists, but how will you ever have the conversation if you can't use the, the, the words? So, uh, you know, in eight years of the Obama administration, it was very obvious that he could not articulate the term Islamist radical ideology. And that was the sort of start or the open invitation to this political correctness that you can't ask open-ended questions about what is happening in the world of jihadist ideology. And what do you think that it's led to now that we're, you know, eight years down that road and, you know, a couple years more? Well, eight years down that road, uh, a lot of harm has been done because uh, when you can't uh, sort of isolate a virus, this, so, so this jihadist global ideology to me is like a virus. And uh, as a doctor will tell you, when there's a virus, you need to first isolate it, you need to identify it, and only then you can find a cure for it. But if you can't even articulate it, if you can't identify it or you're not allowed to, then how are we going to talk about the solutions? So that definitely has put us back many, many years, and it strengthened the extremists. It, it it strengthened the Islamists. And, and when I say Islamists, I'm differentiating between Islam as a spiritual message, which is what I follow, and Islam as a political ideology, which Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and Boko Haram and uh, ISIS follow. And there is a difference in that. 
And so the Islamists, the people who are, who are perpetuating political Islam, they have felt strengthened by the lack of Western leaders in their pointing out where the problem lies. Uh, and so we have to backtrack a lot, but I definitely hope that under this new administration, and I see that that political correctness is not there. In fact, there is no political correctness. And uh, hopefully that will allow us to, to take some measures to strengthen the safety and security of this land that we call home. In uh, your USA Today article, I think in August of 2016, uh, you said a similar comment about President Trump and called on him to you know, put the moderate Muslims on center stage. You said put us out front and you know, use this opportunity to elevate the platform for this sort of discourse. Do you think so far into the administration uh, he's succeeded in that goal? I don't believe so. Uh, I haven't been called upon yet. Maybe others have. But uh, certainly my being a Canadian probably puts me on the lower <laughs> rung of that. Uh, but there have been uh, other pressing urgent issues. I mean, as we know, you know, there's a lot of putting out of fires. There's uh, issues that have just happened in Syria. And so there's definitely uh, other priorities taking place. But there is still hope because the buzz is in Washington and in Canada that the reform, uh, the reformist Muslims are the only solution. That narrative of reform is the only solution to the problem of extremism because there has never been an alternate narrative. What we are trying to do is provide that alternate narrative. We have also said that we are the frontline people who can speak out without being slapped with the label of racism or bigotry because we are practicing Muslims. We also know much more about the depth of the problem which other people, because of their lack of information about the inner workings of the Muslim Brotherhood, of you know the Khomeinis, or uh, you know the the Wahhabi Salafi ideology that is at play, they may not be that clear about what, what the, how to connect the dots. So, you know, when a terrorist attack happens, for example, the first thing some political pundit will come and say is it was a lone wolf attack. In our understanding, there is no such thing as a lone wolf. You know, someone has radicalized that person who has then perpetuated this attack. And that is what we have to find out. We have to see where the radicalization is coming from because terrorism is only a byproduct of radicalization. And this awareness is something that all the leaders have to understand. And that, you know, that this is an ongoing challenge. It will not stop until we do something about it. In your view, do you think there's a disconnect between the view folks in the Muslim community have of you know, incident, lone wolf incidents and you know, the traditional non-Eastern you know, politicians and pundits who view these incidents in perhaps very different ways. Is yes. it a cultural shift or is there, is there a distinction between those two groups and how they view things? I wouldn't say so much a cultural shift. I think this is more based on lack of information or lack of acceptance of what is really happening. So there is a disconnect. There's a very obvious disconnect. But there is a disconnect both between the Mus in, within the Muslim communities, between those who say there is no problem at all and everything is wonderful and all Muslims are peaceful, which is not in fact the truth. And there are those who say that all Muslims are the problem. And between those two, somewhere there is the balance line, which means that, yes, all Muslims are not terrorists, but today all the terrorists are Muslims, or at least what is happening in the Middle East and what we see happening in the Muslim world. So we do need to be cognizant of that. We do need to understand this and deal with it in a very balanced way without going uh, totally extreme on that. Now, your work advocating for you know, gender equity, uh, reform of Islam, um, has, I'd imagine, drawn a lot of ire from a whole host of, of different parties affected. How have you managed to walk that line? With a great deal of difficulty, I would say. Um, it is very challenging. It is very challenging to wake up in the morning and, and see uh, people sending you hate mail. But at the same time, the hope is on those 
who are supporting the work that I'm doing. And that comes from every faith community and every background and every culture. Because the most important thing that I try to make people understand is that these are human rights abuses. And if it is a human rights abuse, everybody should be concerned about it. You know, the problem of uh, gender equality, the problems of terrorism and extremism are not just an American problem. They are for everyone. They is, it is for Muslim Americans, for Americans coming from every background, faith, and culture. Because it is an American problem, and it should have an American solution. Uh, you know, this is not to be ghettoized only for one community to deal with. So yes, I do get backlash, but much more than that, I get support from all over the world, uh, from people who are waiting for a voice of uh, moderation, for people who are waiting for progressive, liberal, reform-minded Muslims to stand up and be honest and say, there is a problem within the House of Islam, and we need to deal with it, we need to recognize it, and we need to talk about solutions. And how do you go about bringing up you know, the next generation of, of leaders in your movement? Well, we have a mandate in our organization, and we call our organization the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow, as opposed to Facing the Seventh Century, which is a lot of well, a lot of people are doing. And we want to, to uh, you know, uh, empower our youth, our Muslim youth, with a very um, in America with an uh, you know a strong Muslim and American Muslim identity, in Canada with a strong Canadian Muslim identity. Uh, we want to encourage them to speak out to to understand that they. They can take great pride in being Muslim, but at the same time, they must also have pride in the national identity of the country that they live in. And that loyalty to the land in which we live is a very important factor of what we teach our children. Uh, we also teach them about pluralism and respect for people of, of all faiths. And our declaration of the reform movement actually identifies all of this. We have it on our website where we say that we want respect for everyone following any path on, or, or those of belief and those of no belief. Uh, you know, this is an important factor in parts of the Muslim world. You're killed if you're an apostate. Uh, this is something that we don't agree with. Uh, we believe that people should have the freedom to believe or not believe and follow their faith in any way they want. And this is what we want to empower our children to understand, that being a good human being then makes them a person of better faith. You mentioned, you know, the a part of Islam kind of looking towards the seventh century, which is you know, a line you hear a lot. And I think a lot of folks would say that there are obviously some problems in the, you know, the Muslim community around the world, obviously. But I think the line is frequently that it's a very small group. It's, it's an isolated group, a very small percentage of a, an enormous faith-based community around the world. But in our conversation, it seems to me that your view is that, well, that, that problem is bigger than most people want to believe. Would that be an accurate assessment of your take? Yes, the problem is bigger than most people believe. You know, I'm on the advisory board of the Clarion Project, and the Clarion Project has made this very powerful short documentary called By the Numbers. And that is based on a Pew poll that was taken in Muslim-majority societies. And it addresses the ideology. So what people have to understand is that it's not only violence that makes people Islamists or people who follow political Islam are not necessarily the overtly violent people. You can actually deal with that much easier. It is the ideology. This is a war of ideas. It is the ideology that we have to talk about. And this Pew Patrol, this documentary by the numbers, identifies that. The millions of people who think that, uh, you know, a woman, that, that their honor killing is just uh, the millions of people who believe that uh, Sharia or Islamic law should be the law of the land even if they live in non-Muslim countries. Uh, the millions of people who believe that it is okay to kill a non-Muslim. And this is the mindset. And this has been growing in the last 30 years because of the indoctrination of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, uh, you know, the Wahhabi Salafi ideology that comes from Saudi Arabia and Khomeiniism out of Iran. So this is what has uh, been sort of uh, inculcating in the minds of people. And when you speak to an ordinary person who is definitely not violent or even prone to violence, or they will say that, you know, what ISIS is doing is terribly wrong. But then you ask them about separation of church and state. And you ask them about the right of Israel to exist. And you ask them about gender equality. And that's your litmus test. It is a mindset. And it is the mindset which is very dangerous. 
because the mindset then leads young people to be sucked into these violent acts. And as you know, many of our young people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, have gone across to fight with ISIS. What makes young, educated, uh, economically uh, independent young people do something like that? It is a warped mindset. And the extremists have so many billions of dollars at their disposal. You, have, you, know, you have to understand that this is a movement that is funded by the oil-rich countries. And there is so much money there that they can buy all the technology they want. They know exactly how Westerners think. They know what makes us tick. They know what buttons to press. And every time uh, there is a terrorist attack, they are laughing because they have been planning this for far longer than our people have understood it could happen. Now, your background is pretty unique. You grew up in Pakistan, uh, were educated there, found your family there, and then came to the West, came to Canada. Um, do you think that that multicultural background has made you more aware of these sorts of problems and given you a, a greater voice to speak out and, and speak to what you see is this big challenge here? Well, living in Pakistan and then for some part of my life in the Gulf countries, there was never the freedom of speech to be able to speak out, and especially as a Muslim woman. So certainly coming to the West has empowered me. You know, this freedom that you get in the West, the freedom of expression, the freedom of choice, uh, the freedom of, of um, press is something that is so unique. Uh, and there's something that I value so much because it has given me, a Muslim woman, a platform to say whatever I want. And it has been a journey of learning. Uh, you know, it's some, not something that I, I knew uh, 20 years ago. Uh, all this has been an awakening and it's been a journey and part of it is very painful because it's like seeing your child become a drug addict. You know, this is my faith, that has, which I love, that has been stolen and represented, reproduced as a violent ideology. So I personally can't stand back and morally or, or ethically see this happen. I, you know, I felt compelled to speak out, uh, and I wish more people would speak out because that is, is what the reality is. But it was a journey, and it's an ongoing journey of learning, educating ourselves, finding out how to connect the dots, and you know, this is our work. This is the work that we do 24-7. And even though I say that I'm retired from a full-time job, I find that I am busier than I ever was in, in my younger age. But you know, we are just sowing the seeds of change for our future generations so that they will hopefully pick up from this and then you know, work towards the reform. And I look at the Christian reform, and I see how many years it took and how bloody and how difficult it was. So obviously, I don't expect any change overnight, and maybe not even in my lifetime. But somewhere, someone has to have the guts to stand up and speak out and sow those seeds of change so that our future generations will benefit. What do you think the biggest barriers are to those folks stepping up and speaking out, you know, the younger generation? Well, the younger generation, one, does not have all the knowledge, and we would like to share some of our knowledge with them. And that's, that's your mission right now. That's right? our mission, and we have a mandate in our organization, the three E's. We say you have to expose the problem, you have to educate the masses, and then you have to find ways to eliminate the problem. So we are at the very first level, which is exposing the problem. And it's difficult because, as I said, you know, religion is very near and dear to people, and it is very difficult to do critical thinking and, you know, to, to critique what is so near and dear to you, but it has to be done. Every faith through the history of mankind has been critiqued. And it is through critique that they have come out shining or they have come out better. I mean, Judaism has been through it, Christianity has been through it, and now it's the time for Islam and Muslims. It is a young faith, so there is a lot of hope. And, you know, this concept of critical thinking is, is an Arabic word called ishtihad, which was reason and logic and critical thinking until the doors were shut in the 17th century to say, no need to critically think anymore. There's no need for reason or logic because it gave the religious leadership uh, the wherewithal to say, we are going to tell you how to practice your faith. There is only one way to do it, and it is our way. And so this is what we are facing right now. Uh, this dogma. And for young people, they're confused. And I feel for them because it's hard to negotiate between what is the truth, 
the religious leaders may be telling them one thing, and they're hearing another voice from the progressive liberal side, and they're not sure where to navigate. And so it is very difficult for them to, to find that, that balance where they still want to be believers, yet they want to be, yet they see what's happening and they question it in their minds, but there's no place for them. So we want to create safe spaces for them between the mosque and the mall, so to speak. And that is part of the work that we do. We have discussions, we have uh, you know, safe spaces where young people can come and ask all their questions. And so we hope that this will bring about change, but it's slow. You know, one topic we've touched on a little bit throughout our conversation so far is you know, the gender equity piece. Um, but I know it's a real cornerstone of the work you do. Can you talk a little bit about the problems you see in that particular sphere of Islam and where you want it to go? Well, in Muslim-majority societies, there are definitely gender issues because largely the Muslim world is patriarchal. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when you have patriarchy, power, and politics, it's a very lethal combination. And uh, it's not embedded in the faith, but in cultural practices, women have been sidelined. I mean, you see a country like Saudi Arabia where women are not allowed to drive. Now, some people may think that that's part of Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. There were no cars when Islam came as a message. So, you know, people, again, need to, need to be reasonable. This is a patriarchy. It, it is a theocracy. It is run by men. And so, you know, when you see women not being allowed to be educated, uh, then you have, one has to question. So a lot of my work is uh, centered around women's rights. And I'll come back again to the Clarion Project, who three years ago produced a documentary called Honor Diaries, which was shown all over the world. And I personally traveled across about 50 campuses in the United States to speak about these issues. And it concerns honor-based violence, which is honor killings, female genital mutilation, and forced and underage marriage, all of which, by the way, are alive and well in the Western world. So it's not something that's happening out there. Uh, you know, that's something that we already deal with, but it's happening right here in Canada, in, in, the, you know, in the US, in the United Kingdom. But since the release of this film, we have been able to, to come a long way. It's become a movement. And there have been laws put into place. Uh, there is a lot of activism. There is a lot of grassroots work being done. So again, it's an issue that is taboo, but we have to speak about it. You talk about the, the problem being a Western one, not just an Eastern one, but a Western one as well, the United States and Canada. Can you put a scope to, to the level of that problem here? Well, there you know, are... How big uh, is it? The, the problem is so big that it is mind-boggling. Right here in the United States, according to some statistics, there are almost half a million women who are either at risk of or have had female genital mutilation. Right in the United States? Right here in the United States. Now, that is something that boggles people's mind, but you just have to Google the statistics. In fact, when this documentary, Honor Diaries, was made, it was right after that that there was a research paper and there, there was a policy to do uh, work on this female genital mutilation issue. And I'm sure there's some, some research statistics out there. And so, um, you know, in Canada, where I live, we have had 23 honor killings since in the last five years or so. And, uh, you know, that's one too many. Uh, young women being killed because of the honor of the family. They're, you know, young women in the prime of their lives. And forced and underage marriage is rampant throughout the Western world. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they had to actually uh, bring down a law to criminalize parents and teachers who were allowing uh, young people to be forced into marriage. And their immigration department works very closely with, uh, these, uh, with these issues so that they can help young women who are being forced to be taken back home in these situations. So the problem is not just happening anywhere else. It's happening right here. But people close their minds to it because it's a taboo subject. Again, political correctness comes into play. But these are human rights abuses. They are not based in any one faith or culture. It is across the board. And it is a human rights abuse, should be addressed as a human rights abuse, and dealt as a human rights abuse. It's obviously, you are tackling this issue head on. Um, and you know, we spoke earlier about you know, it's hard to have hard conversations, and it's even more difficult to 
really engage with them and wrangle with them while you're having them. But do you ever worry that you might push too far? In the past, you've called for um, a three-month ban on all you know, mosque services in Canada after the parliament shooting in 2014. You called for uh, a Muslim ban on immigration a year before Donald Trump did. And those are some pretty bold claims. Do you think those were over the line or do you think those were justified? I don't think they were over the line. And let me correct you. It was not a ban. It was a moratorium. I had asked for a three-month moratorium so that we could clear out some of the messages of hate that were coming from some of the mosques. We know that the Toronto 18, the, the 18 young men of Pakistani origin who were actually the ones who were apprehended for their plot to behead the Prime Minister of Canada had been going to one particular mosque. And I've been getting the messages from there. And it was not for all mosques, but those mosques who are giving extremist messages. And it's re really important to understand that this is the place where people are manipulated and they're brainwashed, and our youth are at risk. So yes, I had asked for a three-month closure, which is not the end of the world. Uh, you know, for Muslims, it's not it, they can pray at home, but this is more important that we find out what kind of messaging was coming. And yes, I had asked for a moratorium from those countries who are funding and promoting and supporting extremism and terrorism so that we can clear up the mess at home and figure out what sort of policies we can put into place to strengthen our national security. And this is what loyalty to the land is all about. When you know that there are extremist elements that are being exported from uh, countries, certainly it is up to the leader of the country to say we want to tighten our policies. So I don't think they were over the top. Many people thought they were over the top, but that's their problem. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so on a lighter note, um, you've been doing this work for a long time. Obviously, you have a great deal of optimism and a great deal of, of faith in your faith uh, and its ability to grow. Looking forward to the next 10, 20 years, what are your goals? I don't even know if I'm going to be around for the next 10, 20 years. But uh, I am an eternal optimist, as you say. My goals are to try and, uh, uh, first of all, uh, empower our youth. And that's important. And, you know, the young women uh, need to be empower empowered to understand that they have rights within the faith and that they should speak out against any kind of abuse, that they have the right and the power to speak out. I deal with a lot of personal cases where I'm mentoring young girls. You know, even in, in uh, Canada where I live, there are some imams who are performing polygamous marriages. Now, if the law is not going to stop them, there's something that we have to do. And, you know, we are dealing with abuse of, of various kinds. So that's the gender piece. In terms of the larger issue, it is to take back the narrative of my faith from the extremists, to, to bring back the beauty in Islam, to bring back the music, the, the art and the culture. And that is our tagline in our organization that, you know, God is beautiful and, and he wants beauty. Islam was never meant to be so dark and violent as, and ugly as the extremists have made it. And we want to wrestle it back from them. You know, this is the faith that I grew up with, a very different faith from what they have turned it into. So I'm at that golden age in my life where I have seen both sides of the coin. And it's unfortunate that many of our young people, including my children, have not seen that other side. And that other side was when I was growing up in Pakistan. It was a different country. It was a different Islam. Totally pluralistic and full of joy and music. And you were allowed to worship any way you wanted. There was no dogma. There was no box that we were forced into. But over a period of time, all that has changed. And it has been turned into something dark and ugly. And when I see um, masses of people in the West, those who are not Muslim, looking at my faith only through the lens of the extremists and the terrorists, it saddens me. I want to turn their face and say, look here, there are the Sufis who are the mystics uh, who dance in ecstasy, and it is so beautiful. And there is so much beauty, but we have to be able to be louder than the extremists. So I would like to drown their narrative with an alternate narrative. Well, Rahil Raza, thank you so much for joining us and for taking the time to speak with me today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, that wraps our conversation with Rahil Raza, and you know, I can only hope that it was as informative and interesting to you as it was for me. Ms. Raza embodies so much in one 
person, so many different aspects, so many different facets of life. And agree or disagree with their positions, some of them, all of them, a few of them, I think there's something to take away from this conversation for all of us. Until next time, for APN, I'm Zach Merchant.